Hello, everyone. Uh, yes, my name is Ben Viba. Uh, I've, uh, I'm originally from the U.S., but uh, grew up in California and New York, and, and uh, now I live here in the U.K., in London, uh, so it's really great to be here. It's my first time at, at EMF. Uh, I've worked in largely film and TV for about 18 years, um, and I uh, produce film festivals and documentaries, uh, things like um, women survivors of the gulag camps, grieving children, humanitarian rangers, you know, light-hearted stuff. Uh, and, um, and I also produce impact campaigns. Uh, how many of you, can I get a show of hands, are familiar with what impact campaigns are about? Does anyone know? Oh, maybe a couple people. Cool. Um, so impact campaigns are an extension of how we can get a game or a film or really anything creative to extend the shelf life uh, and really extend what we can do with a, a creative piece. So whether that's how do we increase just the awareness of what the story is and what it can achieve to how do we increase like social engagement, right? Does it activate people to really think about a topic more? And then Ultimately, is it something that can really have an impact on, you know, a, a social movement, right? Uh, has anyone uh, in here ever engaged in uh, activism, for example? Yeah? A few people? Cool. So, yeah, like social movement is, is really about that. How do we, how do we use a, a film, for example, to encourage people to engage in demonstrations and, and activism and grassroots, you know, mobilizing? And then the ultimate, which is usually what I'm after uh, when I produce impact campaigns, is can we use a film to influence policy and advocacy? So I produced impact campaigns, uh, particularly for Netflix, for films like uh, Barack Obama's uh, program, Our Great National Parks, uh, which is all about trying to get people to appreciate parks and to take care of them and support infrastructure for them. Uh, just like this lovely place uh, that we're all in. And, um, and then I did one for um, uh, David Attenborough's program called uh, Breaking Boundaries and a movie called Don't Look Up. And uh, with Don't Look Up, the, really the goal has been how do we get people to reconcile where propaganda infiltrates what we read and what we watch, right? And how we receive news, how we read news, how we watch news, right? Uh, so let me ask you guys another question. Uh, when you're receiving your news, whatever form that's in, uh, do you feel like you get that information from just one place? No, no one. Uh, do you get it from five or more? Yeah, a lot of places, yeah. And how many of you feel like you're getting most of it from, say, social media? Okay, only a few. How about like TV news, like traditional TV news? Yeah, a few. How about like uh, kind of old, what would be considered now old school news, like, uh, like actual physical publications like newspapers? Yeah, so a few of you. So it's all kinds, right? And so how about digital news channels? Okay, so a lot more, right? So there's a lot more, you know, apparatus for us to be able to receive, uh, right, and, and consume that information. And so with Don't Look Up, what we were trying to figure out was how do we reach people and get them to think about the way they vet information, right, uh, the way they can tell, like, can you tell when you're receiving information if it's accurate or not, if it's true or not? Right, uh, or if it's really led by a lot of you know uh, opinion-based commentary. So let me ask another question. Uh, from the, the any publication you get information from, do you feel like you trust it? Uh, not a lot of hands. <laughs> uh, yeah, and uh, does anyone want to uh, answer to that question? Why you might feel like it's hard to trust where you get information? Yeah? Because they might be trying to take advantage of your own 
scams, taking advantage of people, stealing data. Sure, that's all possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does anyone else have any of those fears? Maybe a few? Yeah. Does anyone else have an answer? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Knowing what particular lean, like political lean or just social lean in, in terms of, yeah, the lens that they see things through. Yeah. And it's not always clear. Some are very obvious uh, what, what kind of uh, opinions, right, they have and some are ambiguous. So the, I mean, the goal of journalism, for example, and this was my goal in, uh, in running the Don't Look Up campaign was, uh, can we get, uh, can we influence the kind of apparatus where journalists can uh, propose, you know, uh, 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 what do you call it, present, you know, news in a way that's uh, not leaning an opinion, because that is, you know, the old adage and, and the ethics of journalism, right? How do you present something without making yourself the story, without providing, uh, uh, you know, telling the, the audience which way to think about it, right? Being objective. Um, so in, in that campaign, what we also did was we built a site and built an aggregator. Uh, and the aggregator was meant to encourage people to take all kinds of steps. Um, you know, uh, steps that could be, uh, you know, positive contributors towards climate action. So, you know, getting people to reduce energy bills, getting people to, uh, you know, uh, cycle more and support infrastructure for things like that. Right, and, and then seeing if people, if that really encouraged people to, to activate and take steps and report on them, uh, and then it created a loop, you know, where we would re-encourage people to watch the film, and we got the cast, like Leonardo DiCaprio and, and Meryl Streep to uh, make extra pieces uh, that really made a more of a call to action. So when someone like Meryl Streep says this is the most important film she's ever worked on, I mean, that's usually pretty powerful for people to hear for someone who's worked on, you know, a, a lot of amazing work. Um, so in, in other pieces, uh, we are also trying to figure out, do you feel like if you were presented something that's clear propaganda, do you feel like you would be able to tell from a raise of hands? Only some of you. Can anyone answer? Okay, for anyone who just raised their hand, can you answer how clearly you think you can tell? Does anyone want to answer? Or a a anyone in the room can answer. I'm sorry? When a politician speaks. Oh, at all. That's very possible. Yes. <laughs> yes, it's true. Okay, actually, that's great. Does anyone in this room, raise of hands, trust politicians in general? Oh, snap. I might agree with you there. How, yeah. how many hands did you see? Uh, none. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's tricky, right? It's tricky. The, you know, the people we, and this is absolutely part of the, part of the movie, right? Is when the people that, even, you know, people that we vote for, uh, yeah, are in positions of power, does that mean we trust them? Or if, say, a new policy or a new bill gets passed and, uh, and the representatives say, well, we care now. This thing we didn't really seem to care about before or the last administration didn't care about, we, we care about. But if they pass something new, how many of you, does, for, yeah, how many of you feel like you automatically will trust that they now care about that thing? Raise hands. No? Still no? All right. Ha, ha, have you ever worked for a, a company and this happens? Hey, we passed a new policy about like your mental health. And uh, we're going to take care of you guys now. We're going we're gonna to show you that we care about you and we're going to make sure you guys are taking care of you, not burned out. How many of you trust that? <laughs> that happens. Too soon! <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. So it, yeah. So it's hard, right? It's hard to trust people, even when they're genuine, and that's what's hard. When when the news apparatus has gone from being something that was, you know, built on something that wasn't a 24-hour news cycle, right? It wasn't. It wasn't about, uh, you know, how do we throw sensationalism at people, you know, create clickbait so that, you know, the 
they get the ratings and they get the views and the audience is, isn't really getting you know, responsible journalism, right? The old setup for, uh, for journalists was, uh, especially in, in countries like here and in the US, right, was the news would be on a few times a day, the government reserved the right to cut in, uh, you know, in case of an emergency, and that was pretty much the relationship, right? That they weren't tied to ratings like entertainment was, which means they were not categorized as entertainment. And somewhere along the line, that changed. And I don't know if a lot of you can remember exactly when it changed. Uh, actually, can anyone remember an exact or a fairly exact time when the news organizations changed to a 24-hour model? No? Who's, what? Sorry, when? Uh, not after that, but it was getting there already, right? Because they saw in the Gulf War that more people were, were you know, demanding more around the clock coverage because it was something big and compelling and, and, uh, and it encompassed you know, interest for the world. But it was, it was more around 2000 and, uh, and events like 9-11, like for example. And that started to, there, there was an audience demand to just uh, want to learn and want to tune in more and more and more and they started running more around the clock. And they saw that that was good business, right? That they could, they could profit off that because all of a sudden they had people's attention. But something like that doesn't happen all the time. It doesn't warrant people's attention all the time. So in the absence of, you know, major uh, world, you know, issues like that or, or, or events, singular events, then what do we have to do? We have to gin up things. We have to create reasons, right? And manipulate our audience to feel like there's urgency all the time, right? Something, you know, big and explosive is happening that needs your attention. And that's what's hard about how we vet our information now, is how do we know something is urgently important that needs us to, to you know, read about it and watch it and tune in all the time. And now with, you know, social media feeds and Twitter feeds and stuff, right? It's refreshing about every five seconds. Is that about what it feels like, five seconds? If you're on a, if you, how many people read uh, news from a feed? Like a Facebook feed or a Twitter feed? How many people? Yeah? How, are you ever able to finish a story before it auto refreshes and there's already new stuff on it? That's very intentional, by the way. <laughs> it makes you feel like you have to be uh, uh, tuning in all the time. Your attention is constantly being moved on to the next thing. So, so even something that's made to feel urgent, but it's, it's just urgent enough to keep you, you know, keep your attention going and then moving you on to the next thing. Which means that it's hard to differentiate between which stories are important and which ones are not. Uh, does it feel like, do you feel like there's an ask from anyone anymore to vet information. Yeah? Like even if you wrote something for school or work, do you think there's the same kind of pressure anymore to vet your information? No? I even uh, asked a teacher, my daughter's starting secondary school next year, so I was touring secondary schools and, I, and the one question I, I had uh, uh, to ask them was, how do you help kids vet information when they're writing things like essays and stuff, right? Do they write a bibliography? Do they have to cite multiple sources? And uh, you know what the answer was? Who, who thinks it was a good answer? <laughs> he said, we know they're going to use chat GPT. So what are you going to do? Uh, I didn't really have a follow-up. <laughs> to that one. I was just like, okay, man. <laughs> I guess that's the future, right? Um, you know, so that's exactly what we're trying to, to get at, you know, is, is even if the future is, we know people are going to embrace, you know, things like that, things like chat, GPT, and technology, and, and they're not going to ask as many questions, but how do we keep everyone curious? How do we keep everyone inquisitive and interested in making sure that they're not just taking everything at face value, 
Because if we're getting all our information from, you know, a myriad of sources, and those sources could be everything from, you know, a, a, a trusted, established voice of reason uh, versus your friend, <laughs> who we love our friends, but our friends might not necessarily be experts, right? And, you know, but, but how do we tell the difference? How do we tell the difference? And it's getting harder to do that. And, and it's getting harder to push back when, you know, we're so kind of overstimulated uh, all the time and people don't have deeply rooted conversations. How many people like coming to events like this to have good conversations with folks? Yes, I know I do. I've had really good ones. But outside of coming to places like this, do you feel like you get that chance a lot to just kind of have some calm and, and, and have those times to get kind of, kind of deeper with people? Yeah. <laughs> exactly, yes. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, so that's why I really appreciate places like this and, and, uh, and getting, to, getting to run impact campaigns is something that hopefully, you know, can, can really, yeah, uh, influence people to go further. I mean, I've been able to be a part of ones, uh, like with a film called Dark Waters, if you guys ever saw that with Mark Ruffalo, we were able to take that to EU Parliament and they uh, ended up passing new legislation on forever chemicals. Uh, if anyone's not familiar with those, it's, they're called forever chemicals because when, when they end up being exposed to something like a body of water, they're, they're basically in there forever. Like you, you, you can't completely get rid of them and they make people very sick. Um, we did one, in fact, Don't Look Up contributed to this, also a movie called The Territory uh, about deforestation regulations and practices. Um, we were able to get like 600 uh, members of EU Parliament to watch these films. And, uh, and just use those as tools, as stimulation, right? You know, to impact those conversations and, and then hopefully, you know, I mean, <laughs> like we alluded to before, you, you know, we can give politicians like the ammo uh, and then hopefully they take that and, and actually do, do something tangible with it. Um, so, so yeah, I'm, um, yeah, I'm just really uh, glad you guys are here tonight. Um, the, the film we're going to show you is Don't Look Up. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Um, does anyone have any, any questions uh, about impact campaigns or anything? Oh, in the back. I, I can come back to you. What's your question? I was just going to say, where do, you get, where do you get valid sources of information that you've said? Uh, I totally agree with your statement, yeah. and I think a lot of people would. If everything you've got, look at what happens with Trump and the um, distillery, sure. and then the misuse of the um, media, social media, back to your points. Where would you go for valid information? Some people say it doesn't stand up. I'd go to multiple sources. Are you going to do that for everything you want to see in the news? Uh, that's hard, right? Yeah. Where do we, how do we know how to vet our sources? Where would I go for valid information? So, why I asked you guys uh, before why I uh, liked using like five sources is because there are way more sources now, right? Before a lot of people, you know, would watch say traditional TV and you'd have, you know, three, four, five uh, news outlets maybe who were kind of traditional sources of, of information and then you knew that there was a process. You know, they had a red team that poked holes in, in the stories and and you knew that they wouldn't dare go on air unless they had usually had it right. Not always, but you know, 90%. But yeah, now, uh, you know, I will do everything from, yeah, look at social media feeds, see what's trending, why is it trending, is it trending just because it's buzzy, you know? Uh, but then also check outlets that you know are reliable. I mean, old school print newspapers that have been around for 30, 40, 50, 60 years. Uh, there's a reason for that, and hopefully not all of them have lost their reputation. Some of them have, you know, a little bit. I think the goal is that you're, you're never going to find one that's perfect. I think the, the goal is how do we keep people curious to not just take one person's word for it. I think that's the ask, right, is if someone says something, you, you read something and you're like, great, moving on. 
because that's what the feed wants you to do, right? Move on. You read something quick, move on, so that you're not really digging and you're not really being curious to, to dive deeper into it. So I think it's, you're not going to find a bulletproof source. Uh, but you, uh, I am encouraging you guys to look in multiple places, have deeper discussions with people. You know, there is no perfect answer to whether you're going to be right all the time or the people you're listening to are going to be accurate all the time. But, but that's the thing. We, we, just need, we need a society that stays curious and, and that's how we stir the kind of crazy innovation that I have seen all around this park. Uh, and why this event is now my favorite. Uh, yes, yeah, all my best time. <laughs> yeah, there's some, there's some wild, wild stuff and very cool people here. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your question. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Oh, I, I think I see it in the light. Yes. Yeah, I just wondered if you thought there was a big difference between the power of fictional narrative and the documentary narrative? Yes. Influence. Good question. Yes. Uh, is there a big difference between fiction and non-fiction narratives in terms of, yeah, the kind of impact or influence or how people receive them? Yes. So I primarily produce documentaries. Um, the last documentary I produced was called Beautiful Something Left Behind. I'm not sure where you can watch it here. It's on Paramount+. Plus. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure uh, in how many places that's available. But that one's about uh, grieving children. So that one, for example, is uh, it's, it's a hard watch because of the topic. And so a lot of people won't necessarily watch it thinking it's entertainment. They will watch it thinking they're, it's, it's for education and information. And when you watch a film like Don't Look Up, it can actually engage people more broadly because uh, the audience never feels like they're being talked at. They're just, uh, they're being given something that's has levity to it, but at the same time is stimulating the conversation. So uh, I think they both have a role to play. This is why I think no film has to be ideologically activist. Um, they all have something important to say in the end. So yeah, uh, thank you guys so much. And I hope you enjoy the movie.